Now, when we talk about Christmas bringing hope, we're not talking about simply a Christmas holiday bringing hope, just the fact that we have a holiday, we don't have to work. Uh, that's not what brings us hope. It's what it represents. Uh, it represents the birth of Christ. Now, we need hope in our world today. There's a lot of hopelessness around us. Sin has brought many problems into the world. Many people are anxious. Many people are stressed out. They're, they're thinking that, where is the hope in all these terrorist activities across the world? How can they be stopped? There's economic problems. There's employment issues. There's relationship difficulties. They all can cause stress and hopelessness in people. And what do people turn to? They turn to various addictions, such as alcohol, drugs, gambling, sexual perversions outside of marriage. Why do people harm themselves? Why do they harm other people? Why do people commit suicide? Because they feel hopeless. They feel there's nothing to live for. The problems they face seem too big to overcome. There's no way to surmount their problems, so they seek to escape from their problems. And oftentimes, or every time, escape through sin destroys their lives in an even greater degree and affects people around them. And so where can we find hope in the world today? It's only through Jesus Christ. Outside of him, there is no lasting hope. Ephesians 2, verse 12, I'd encourage you to take out the white page in the middle of your bulletin. As the verse is written out, as well as the sermon outline, and on the back are some study questions that you can dig in a little more deeply. Ephesians 2, verse 12 says, Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ. And Paul is writing to believers here, but he's talking about before they were believers. You were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. And so unbelievers, people who do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, are without hope because they are without God. Only God can bring us true hope. Now people try to fool themselves or perhaps fool others. And say they've got it all together, nothing bothers them, but deep down there is a core of hopelessness in anyone who is not a believer. People without Christ always attempt to put their hope in the things of this world. You know, if I just got a promotion, then everything would be okay. If I just had more money, then everything would be okay. If I just got a new relationship, then everything would be okay. But nothing outside of Jesus Christ brings true hope. Romans 15, 12 says, quoting the prophet Isaiah, it says, the root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations, the Gentiles will hope in him. Speaking of Jesus Christ, speaking of the Messiah who was to come, Jesus will rule over the nations, he rules now. We don't see the rule complete. One day when he returns again, the rule will be complete. But even now, the nations put their hope in him. A relationship with Jesus Christ brings hope in this life because God has a perfect plan for your life, for my life. He has a purpose for our days upon the earth, and that gives us hope. This is not a meaningless, hopeless existence, just going from day to day. There's a plan, there's a purpose that God has for us to carry out. 1 Peter 1 verse 3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth into a living hope. Underline that, living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And so when a person becomes a believer, they are, as it were, born again, born into this living hope, born out of hopelessness into a life of hope through Jesus Christ. And the hope for a believer encompasses this entire life. God has a plan and purpose from the day you're born until the day you draw your last breath. But it doesn't end there. It continues beyond this life into an eternity with Jesus Christ, who is alive, who is risen from the dead. 
And so when we live with this confident hope in Jesus Christ for this life and the life to come, we have a wonderful opportunity to share that hope with those who are hopeless, to those who are struggling with having hope. And so today, the message is entitled, Waiting and Hoping. We're going to be looking at a story in the New Testament to answer the question, how can we experience God's hope in our lives in a greater dimension, and how can we share that with others? We're going to look at the circumstances surrounding the birth of a baby who was born six months before Jesus was born. This was a baby that God had a wonderful plan for his life, a wonderful purpose, and his name was John. And so to grow in hope, we must wait on the Lord. Our story begins in Luke chapter 1, verse 5. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. And so our story begins with this Jewish couple, Zechariah and Elizabeth, living in Judea at the same time as Joseph and Mary. Both Zechariah and Elizabeth were from the priestly tribe of Levi. They'd faithfully served God all their days, their entire lives. And as we're going to see, they've been praying to God for years for a child. They wanted a family, but nothing had happened. But yet they kept on serving God. Verse 6, both of them were upright in the sight of God observing all the Lord's commands and regulations blamelessly. And so God's word tells us that Zechariah and Elizabeth were people of faith. They sought to follow God's plans and commands in all of their lives. Their prayers for a family had not been answered. But they were not bitter. They were not angry at God. They kept right on serving God, trusting that God's ways were best, even as year after year after year passed. They kept on serving God and waiting on God even when it seemed hopeless. Verse 7, but they had no children because Elizabeth was barren and they were both well along in years. It's hard to keep hope when the years pass by. And you know the biological clock is ticking. And they were getting older and older. Elizabeth was not becoming pregnant. They were both old now. Elizabeth was elderly, past the time to have children. And their dream of having a child seemed hopeless. And yet, they kept on serving God. They kept on waiting on God. They kept on, as we'll see, praying. Even when it didn't seem humanly possible that they would have a child. And what we see going on with Zechariah and Elizabeth fits a pattern that we see over and over again in Scripture, and we see over and over again in life. This godly couple had a vision. It was a vision from God to have a family, to have a son. It was a good vision, but as the years passed, one after the other, as they went from their 20s to their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, the vision seemed to be dying as each year passed until they were so old, the vision seemed to be dead. And yet, as we'll see in this story, God is going to resurrect this vision through a miracle. He's going to bring that vision back to life. And so, also in our own lives, we often see the same pattern. God places a vision in our hearts, and we get excited about it. And then it doesn't happen. Time goes by, and we keep waiting, we keep hoping. And time continues to pass, and it seems that the vision is completely dead. It, we don't see how it's ever going to come to pass. And yet, if the vision is truly from God, we must keep waiting on God. Keep serving the Lord until he resurrects that vision, until he brings it back to life, brings it back from the dead, as it were. So as we wait on the Lord, be listening for God to speak to you, because when he does, we need to hear his 
voice and believe his promise. And so life continued through the years for Zechariah and Elizabeth. They faithfully served God, but one year, something different happened. Something unusual happened. Something that indicated that this year was different from the other years before. Something that indicated that God was at work in their lives. Verse 8. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord to burn incense. So at that time in Jerusalem, there were literally thousands of priests, just like Zechariah. One of the special duties of a priest was to be able to burn incense in the temple of the Lord. But there were so many priests, and this only happened every so often, that this special privilege was really a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. You got to do it once, and that was it. A whole life serving as a priest, and one time you got to burn incense. And so Zechariah was chosen this year to go into the temple and burn the incense, something he'd never done before, something he would never do again. And so God was at work in Zechariah and Elizabeth's life, even though they didn't know it. But God had a plan. So on his assigned day, Zechariah went into the holy place in the temple to burn incense. He went in by himself. The priests always went in by themselves. The worshipers were outside praying. And he went into the holy place to burn incense on the altar of incense. And suddenly, as he was in this place all by himself, he was surprised to see an angel standing beside the altar of incense. He was filled with fear. He was startled. He didn't know what to say. The angels usually talk first. The angel said, what do angels say to people? What is the line they memorize in heaven? <laughs> do not be afraid. See, they always start with that because people are very afraid of angels. So angels are not like the little cupids we see on the Christmas cards. They wouldn't scare anybody, would they? Angels are far more awesome uh, than what we see depicted there. The angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. And so the angel's words indicated that not only had Zechariah continued to pray for a child, he had not given up, but God had heard his prayer. God had heard his prayers and his wife's prayers down through the years. Decades they've been praying for a child. God had heard. And now, finally, the time to answer that prayer had come. He would have a son, and the son would be named John. Now, the angel went on to tell Zechariah what God's plan for his son would be. Verse 17, he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And so their son would be a special son. He would be a prophet. He would prepare people for the coming of the Messiah, for the coming of Jesus Christ. And so John would not be an ordinary son. He would be used mightily by God in many ways. And when God speaks, even though his promise seems incredible, we mustn't doubt his word. Verse 18, Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel answered, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. I've been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And so now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their proper time. Well, now our picture of Zechariah as the perfect man of faith breaks down a little bit. An angel of God is speaking to him, and Zechariah doubts what the angel has to say, how it can possibly come true, because he looks at himself, he looks at his wife. We're old. This can't happen. How can I believe you? It seems to me, reading between the lines, that Gabriel was annoyed with Zechariah. 
if an angel can be annoyed, I think Gabriel was quite annoyed. He said, do you know who's talking to you? I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. God has sent me to give you a message, and you're doubting me? Okay. You're not going to be able to speak again if all the words that come out of your mouth are words of doubt until what I say comes to pass. Now, this was the same Gabriel who appeared to the prophet Daniel in the Old Testament. This is the same Gabriel who would appear to Mary and announce the birth of Jesus Christ. And yet, God was still faithful. Zechariah's prayer was still answered, even though he had a little trouble believing that the answer had come. And so when you're waiting and hoping for something that God has put on your heart, be alert to see God at work, even before the answer comes. We always think nothing is happening. But we can't see all the things that God is doing behind the scenes. Believe that God has a plan and he's putting together the pieces. And the answer is going to come at the right time. It's not going to come a day too early. It's not going to come a day late. Why did Zachariah and Elizabeth have to wait so long for the birth of John? They had to wait for Jesus. If he had been born when they were 20s, Jesus wouldn't have been ready. It was all part of the plan. There's a lot of pieces to God's plan, and they have to fit together. And so we listen for God to speak to us, because inevitably, you will have a part to play in God's plan for your life. Zechariah had a part to play. He and his wife had to had something to do, should we say it that way, in order to have a son. They had to keep believing God. Believe the words that God speaks to you. God speaks in many, many different ways. God speaks through angels. We see that here. God can still speak through angels. I think I would like to see an angel. I'm not sure. I'm not quite sure about the scary part. God speaks through circumstances. God speaks through the Holy Spirit. God speaks through the Bible. God speaks through other people. God can speak in many different ways, and we need to have ears to hear what God is saying to us about his plan as we are waiting for answers to come. And so step out in faith. Continue believing God. Believe that God will bring the answer in his timing because he knows the whole picture. We're just looking at ourselves what we want. God knows the whole picture, how it all fits together. And he has the perfect timing. And when the answer comes, we can celebrate God's answer. Verse 24, after this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he's shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Now, we don't really know why Elizabeth remained in seclusion for five months. I mean, perhaps she had some doubts. But we don't know why she hadn't had children. Maybe she had miscarriages. You know, maybe she got, we don't know. But she kept it hidden for five months. And finally, after five months, said, this is really happening. I am pregnant and I'm going to, I'm going to let people know. The Lord has done something special for me. The Lord has blessed us. He's taken away the disgrace. In those days, to be without a child was considered almost like a curse. Children are a blessing from the Lord, and to not have children was, people wondered what was wrong with you. There was something wrong. And so God took away her disgrace by blessing her with a son whose name would be John. Now, when the baby was born, all the relatives gathered around, and they, the custom of the day, would, he should be named after his father, Zechariah. And so, Zechariah, his, his mother, Elizabeth, said, no, his name is John. And they, that's not, <laughs> you know, that's not right. His father's name is Zechariah, so let's ask his father. And Zechariah couldn't speak, and so they gave him a tablet, and he wrote on the tablet, 
His name is John. Everybody went, oh. And the minute he said it was John, his lips were opened, he began to speak again, and he praised God for what God had done. And then Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he began to prophesy concerning his son John, his son who would prepare the way for God's son, for the Messiah, Jesus Christ. The first part of Zechariah's prophecy spoke, as, spoke of Jesus as our great hope. Verse 68, Praise be to the Lord. This is Zechariah prophesying. The God of Israel, because he has come and has redeemed his people, he's raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. And so Zechariah here was prophesying of this coming redeemer, redeemer who would bring salvation, who would be from the lineage of David. Now, he was obviously not speaking of his own son. The priests were from the tribe of Levi. They were not from the house of David. But he was speaking of the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ, our great hope. And so Zechariah goes on to prophesy that this Redeemer would rescue them from their enemies. And this coming Redeemer would be served by all true believers in righteousness and holiness. And so he began by prophesying about the coming Messiah. But what about his own son? What was John's purpose? Well, it was to give others the hope of Jesus. Verse 76, he prophesies to his own newborn son. He says, and you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him. And so Zechariah's son, John, we commonly refer to him as John the Baptist, would be a prophet of God. John's purpose was to go before the Lord Jesus, to prepare the way for Jesus' ministry. Jesus himself said that John was a great messenger, a great prophet of God that was preparing his way. I was wondering, did Zachariah and Elizabeth get to see Jesus? And we know that Mary went to visit Elizabeth when she was pregnant, so I would assume they got to see each other's babies. Well, we don't know if they lived long enough to see Jesus in his public ministry. Probably not, because that was 30 years later. But they knew they'd played an important part, Zachariah and Elizabeth, in God's plan of salvation. And now they understood why they had to wait so long. It was so that John could prepare the way for Jesus. And so John's purpose was to point people not to himself, but to the Lamb of God, to Jesus Christ. John said fam famously in John 3.30, he, speaking of Jesus, must become greater and I must become less. And so John, as he began his public ministry, he preached that people should repent, that she, people should be baptized. People began to follow John. And then when Jesus appeared, John baptized Jesus and he began to recede and Jesus began to he lifted up, and people began to follow Jesus. He'd fulfilled his purpose in life. And so for us as well, life is not just about us. It's about people finding Jesus. And so this Christmas season, what are you waiting and hoping for? What prayer have you been praying? What vision do you have from God that hasn't come to pass yet? If your hope is from the Lord, keep on believing. Keep on waiting. God is at work. Even though you can't see anything happening, God is at work behind the scenes. He has a plan. And he's going to bring the answer. He's going to bring his promise to pass in your life in the proper time. Keep on serving God. Don't get angry. Don't get bitter at God. Because the answer hasn't come yet. You can... Mess the whole thing up that way. Keep on waiting. Keep on believing. Keep on pointing people to Jesus. And then just like Zachariah and Elizabeth, you'll be able to celebrate God's answer to your prayers. This morning, if you're not sure that you're a believer, if you look inside your soul and you see hopelessness, God wants to replace that hopelessness with hope. And he does that 
by sending Jesus as your Savior. And so we're going to pray a simple prayer this morning. If you've never prayed a prayer like this, I'd encourage you to pray along with me. Or you can recommit your life to the Lord if you've been, if you feel like you're off track and you want to get on track with Jesus Christ. Simply admit that you've sinned, that you've done wrong, that you've been following your own plan for your life. Believe that Jesus died to forgive you and commit your life to following his plan. So let's bow our heads right now. And I encourage you to pray along with me. Father, today, I admit that I've been following my own plan for my life. And I don't have much hope in my own plan. Please forgive me. I know you have a plan for my life, and I believe Jesus died on the cross, that my sins might be forgiven, that I might follow you and not myself. Come into my life. I commit myself to following you and your plan and purpose for my life from this day forward. And for those of us who are believers, let's pray that God would increase our hope. Father, we thank you today for the example of Zachariah and Elizabeth thousands of years ago. Help us to learn from that example. Help us to keep on serving you. Help us to keep on believing you, even when your answer seems to be delayed. Forgive us for doubting your goodness. Forgive us for doubting your love. Forgive us for doubting your ability to do what we think is impossible. God, today we affirm that with you, nothing is impossible. And every promise you give, you're capable of bringing to fulfillment. We believe that you're at work in our lives and that you have a plan and purpose. And we want to walk out that plan and purpose with you. We trust you to bring about the best for our lives and for our church family. Use us, God, as part of your plan. Just as you use John to point other people to Jesus. May we not hide the hope that we have. But we, let, let, let us let that hope out that others might see and find the true hope that we found in Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.